I want to get your read, first of all, on that UN vote, because we saw how Beijing and Moscow committed very publicly to this no limits partnership before the Olympics. That being the case, why would China abstain? Why not go all the way and vote with Russia in condemning the resolution and in doing so, bring along the African countries that tend to, tend to vote with China? You know, this is really a terribly tricky state of affairs for the Chinese leadership. You know, on the one hand, they've been building this strong strategic relationship with Russia for a while. And then on the other hand, they do not want to get on the wrong side of a global shift in opinion in against Russia and you know in a way that might have some blowback for China. So I think abstaining and kind of keeping their position a little vague mm -hmm. is the closest thing they can find to a good solution, but definitely uh, you know, they'd rather, I think, that this was not happening at all. Right, right. But they're trying to have it both ways, I suppose, to the extent that they can. Obviously, inside Taiwan, there's a lot of talk that Beijing could take advantage of a distracted U.S. and Europe and step up its pressure on, ta on Taiwan, if not militarily, then at least through rhetoric. What's your take on that? How are you thinking about that? Yeah, I don't think that this situation is very likely to change Beijing's calculus much. So I think the PRC leadership has been at pains in over the last year and even more than a year to make sure that uh, Taiwan understands and that the U.S. understands that there are limits to what it can accept in terms of Taiwan's behavior and in terms of the U.S. kind of encouraging Taiwan to act in ways that the PRC can't really accept. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the activity that we've seen, you know, the military buildup and kind of rhetorical um, scaling up of, of Beijing's rhetoric, I don't think that this was, that those things ever really meant that uh, the PRC was on the verge of taking action against Taiwan. So the idea that somehow uh, the Ukraine war would give Beijing permission or cover, I think that's unlikely because the PRC is unlikely to act outside of its own timeline. Mm -hmm. Um, or to be kind of pulled into something by somebody else's initiative. So I don't think it's so likely, actually, that um, this is a, an opportunity for Beijing. OK, so it wants to operate on its own timeline. But what if it gets pulled in by, let's say, the U.S.? Because there are people within the U.S. who say China is going to take advantage of this opportunity. So maybe we need to uh, be more forthright in our defense, our support of Taiwan, and perhaps we should uh, sell more arms to Taiwan, or maybe we should uh, make a grand statement in showing Taiwan our military support. Would that push China to do something? So this is what the PRC is really most worried about, I think, is that the U.S. will somehow indicate to Taiwan, you know, you have unconditional support from Washington if you think it's the right moment to declare independence, you know, maybe you could get away with it. One, Taipei is not interested in declaring independence right now, right? So, so they're, that's not uh, in the cards on mm. the Taiwan side. Mm -hmm. But I think for Beijing, they don't want to count on that, right? They have a lot of uh, misgivings about Taiwan's leadership and about Taiwan's population. So for me to say, don't worry about it, uh, Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen is not going to declare independence. You can relax. That that has never had any effect at all on people that I've talked to in, in mainland China. So what they want is they want the U.S. to restrain its own behavior and its own rhetoric to ensure that Taiwan doesn't get the wrong idea or doesn't get maybe the right idea in the view of some Americans who think that maybe, uh, you know, this is the right moment. 
One thing that happened within the last 24 hours that I found really kind of encouraging was uh, the Biden administration has sent this delegation of Americans to Taiwan to provide reassurance, Mm -hmm. led by the former uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mike Mullen. And Admiral Mullen's statement in Taiwan included a sentence that said, Uh, The U.S. policy continues to be that we do not support unilateral change to the status quo. Or sorry, sorry, not that we do not support. The U.S. opposes unilateral change Mm. to the status quo. What that means is, and what that has meant for a long time, for decades actually, is the U.S. is opposed to uh, mainland China trying to use military force to coerce Taiwan, but the U.S. is also opposed to Taiwan unilaterally acting to formally separate itself Mm -hmm. or actually declare independence. So I think that was actually a very strong restatement of Mm -hmm. a longstanding U.S. position, which is, no, you know, we just, and, and he also reiterated this, we just need for you both sides to maintain peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. We are not trying to get a particular outcome here. And we don't, we actually oppose either side trying to change the picture unilaterally. So what the US is saying basically is, all things considered, we are in firm support of the status quo and nothing changing. Just everyone stay where you are and don't change anything. Yeah, and you know, that's been the US position for a really long time. And it has enabled peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait for a really long time. So, you know, I I get the I know that there is a faction in the United States that, you know, is tired of peace and stability. Um, (laughs) I am not on on that team. You know, I'd rather have peace and stability than um, the alternative in Ukraine. Yeah, uh, I think most people would agree that they would prefer peace and stability. Nevertheless, this has got to be playing havoc on people in Taiwan and their fears on what could happen. If China were to militarily invade Taiwan, what is our understanding about just how far the U.S. would go to defend Taiwan? Well, you know, the U.S. has always kept the a certain amount of ambiguity about that because precisely because an unconditional guarantee of military intervention by the US could be just what some people in Taiwan need to say okay let's go for it you know mm-hmm. let's go ahead and declare independence because the US has given us an unconditional security guarantee so the US has been really reluctant to do that because we the you know US officials haven't wanted to encourage Taiwanese to act in a way that could put both Taiwanese and uh, Americans mm-hmm. in danger. This all sounds very logical and reasonable and rational. What could upset this? What could cause someone to act irrationally, to, I don't know, to act like Vladimir Putin and do something that would defy a lot of people's expectations? Yeah, you know, I think one thing that a lot of Americans uh, who follow these relationships really closely worry about is some kind of domestic disruption in the People's Republic of China that might cause the leadership to worry that their grasp on power is in peril Mm -hmm. and that they need to show some kind of major, you know, nationalist achievement in order to avoid being overthrown or replaced or edged aside or whatever, you know, perhaps that's part of what's motivating Putin here is the sense of, you know, that his government is performing badly in terms of economic and other uh, domestic goals. And so he's going to show the Russian people just how powerful and strong he can be. Mm. And I think what we see in in this moment is precisely the message that I think many in Beijing will recognize as a cautionary tale, Mm. which is that you think that, you know, showing strength externally is going to work to your benefit, but it can also backfire. And whether or not, um, the Russian army is successful in 
occupying Kiev or decapitating, whether figuratively or literally, we still don't really know, the Ukrainian government. You know, these are things that people imagine happening in Taiwan. Decapitation is a word I hear all the time with respect to how the PRC might handle Taiwan. But whether or not these invasions succeed, what we can see now is that they do not go over well with the international community. Mm -hmm. They do not shock and awe neighboring countries into submission and acquiescence. And in fact, they, they have the potential to impose a really heavy economic cost and political and reputational cost on the initiator of the conflict. Yeah. Well, one thing I suspect that, that Chinese leaders already knew that, uh -huh. but they're seeing it again. Yeah, they're seeing it play out in real time. One thing that's different, of course, uh, between Taiwan and Ukraine is that Taiwan is not officially recognized as its own country, whereas Ukraine is. I, I want to go back to something you had talked about earlier about China, because it's got its own timeline here. One thing yeah. that we know about China that's so different from the U.S. and Europe is that it can afford to play the long game, the really long game. It's got its own timeline. It's got its own logic that may not be driven or that's definitely not driven by electoral politics. Describe for us very quickly what that logic looks like right now. You know, I think the um, some of the things that Putin has been saying are eerily reminiscent of things that the PRC government says about Taiwan. So uh, Ukraine has been part of Russia from time immemorial, even to, you know, the Ukrainians don't have a real language. They just have a dialect of Russian. These are things that, um, you know, we frequently hear about Taiwan from voices in mainland China. So the idea that, you know, this is part of our motherland and soon Sooner or later, we will uh, bring it back under the flag of, you know, our central government, the, the representation of our motherland as we understand it. You know, that's that's very much the position that China takes with respect to Taiwan. The question is, what are you willing to lose in order to attempt that outcome? And is there a way to have that outcome that doesn't involve incurring such a heavy mm -hmm. price? Mm -hmm. And I think for Beijing, the possibility of gaining the outcome that they need in the future is still strong enough that as long as they don't lose what they urgently require in the short run, which is that Taiwan not become independent and therefore foreclose the possibility of unification in the future. You know, as long as that doesn't happen, I believe that uh, the PRC government can wait a bit longer. So it sounds like for Taiwan to survive and to not be in political or military peril, it just has to give China the impression that it's happy not pursuing independence and it'll just kind of stay with, with the current situation. I mean, the, you know, uh, people in Beijing would not like to hear it put that way because <laughs> they want us to feel that urgency. You know, they uh -huh. want us to believe that they are in fact in pursuit of unification. But what can I say? You know, they have tolerated this situation for the last 70 years. Yeah. And in by tolerating this situation, right, by not pushing this envelope, the PRC has achieved incredible success in terms of its uh, economic development, the human development for its people, you know, staying out of wars for 70 years, you save a lot of money that you can spend on way more important things.